My name is Kiernan and I will be your host on behalf of Proof for Less and Inca Expert Travel. Today's session is focused on Machu Picchu's legacy with our expert, Dr. Javier Puente. Thank you to everyone watching on Zoom and Facebook Live. We are so happy to share this special event with you. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you know how to participate in today's event. Dr. Puente will be answering some questions from the audience after his lecture. Please feel free to submit your questions to him at any time during the presentation. For those joining us on Zoom, just type your question into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom panel. For those joining us on Facebook, just leave a comment in the comment section of the Facebook Live stream. After the event, be on the lookout for, all, for an email from us with, an, with a link to the recorded lecture. I encourage you all to participate in sending in your questions as Dr. Puente will be more than happy to answer them. Today, we are pleased to welcome back our expert, Dr. Javier Puente, an interdisciplinary scholar of Andean environments and politics. Javier is also an assistant professor of Latin American studies at Smith College, where he teaches classes about agrarian landscapes and rural environments. Today, he'll be discussing the fascinating and convoluted history of Machu Picchu and its legacy as a national symbol of Peru. He is the author of more than half a dozen publications, received a PhD from Georgetown University, and has held appointments at Lehigh University, Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society, the John Carter Brown Library, and Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. When he's not teaching, Javier enjoys traveling, jogging, playing soccer, boxing, and cooking. Hi, Javier. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Kieran, and it's a pleasure to be with you and with all the audience. Great. Well, before we get started, I was hoping if you could tell us a little bit about when and how you first learned about Machu Picchu. So, well, I'm, I'm Peruvian. I was, I was born in Peru, and so Machu Picchu is sort of embedded in my DNA. Um, and um, because of some family businesses, we actually grew up as a family in Cusco. So my first visit in Machu Picchu occurred at a very early age. Uh, since then, I returned, I think, a total of 12 times to the Inca ruins. And um, like I said, it's, it's sort of coded in my DNA. That's wonderful. Do you have a favorite memory from the 12 times you've been? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, I, I think one of, something that I would share with the audience before the lecture is that uh, no matter how many times you go, it's always impressive. It's, it's breathtaking. And um, I guess I do my best to uh, steer away from sort of the nationally sentiments that relate to Machu Picchu. But nevertheless, it, it impresses me every time. And every single time I, 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 I have been there and I look forward to returning to at some point once, once the pandemic, pandemic is over, um, it, it's, it's the same impression that I'm, I'm seeing something absolutely breathtaking. That's so wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Before I pass the mic over to you to get started for your presentation, I just wanna remind the audience one more time that they can submit questions for you at any time through Facebook Live comment section or the Zoom Q&A feature that's right there at the bottom of the panel. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the presentation. And thanks again to you, Javier. Thank you, Kiernan. So thank you once again to all the, um, um, people who have organized these to Peru for Less and, and its director, Bernard uh, Schlein, for um, accepting uh, the challenge of, of, of doing this lecture series. Um, I also would like to thank you, Lizzie Thomas and Michael Wick, and of course, Kieran and Cochran, who are spearheading the process and the organization. Um, it, is, um, it is a pleasure to be with you. And um, I, I very much look forward to, to your questions at the end of this talk. Um, so one of the first things I guess I would like to share with you is, and you might have seen this on the news, is how Machu Picchu has been recently subject to um, another wave of global news. Um, a Japanese tourist um, that had been stranded in uh, the nearby town of Aguas Calientes for eight months due to the pandemic. Uh, was finally allowed to, um, to enter uh, the, the Inca site. And he became, in, in many ways, uh, the first, um, let's call it post-pandemic visitor of Machu Picchu. Uh, some, some folks on social networks suggested that this could be great material for a screenplay, uh, for some series, at least a documentary, who knows? Uh, but it's, it's a fascinating story. And, um, 
more so than the story itself, I think it has been interesting to see how the Peruvian Ministry of Tourism has once again transformed this circumstance into yet another opportunity for showcasing the position of Machu Picchu, uh, both within the global domestic, within the domestic um, political economy of Peru and, and also within the global landscape of, of, of capitalist tourism. Um, to me, it was really uh, incredible to, to see how they see this, this, this uh, very interesting event and, um, and just transform it into a, a message that is sponsors tourism. And that message is basically, no matter how long you have to wait, these seemingly sempiternal ruins will be there waiting for you. Um, whether you have to wait eight months in Aguascalientes or uh, you know two years in your home countries, uh, Machu Picchu will be there once this is all over. But will they? I mean, will Machu Picchu be there? Uh, and that's one of the questions that I intend to explore with you today. Um, as it happened with my lecture on the culinary boom, um, I think um, those of you who are um, uh, expecting some sort of like um, uh, propaganda about Peruvian cuisine uh, might be disappointed. Um, instead, uh, what I want to do with you today is sharing some questions and problems related to the history of the site, its legacy, its, its shaky present, and, um, and potentially um, its, its very um, uncertain future. It's very uncertain future. Um, in the midst of travel restrictions, a stalled tourism economy, and, and who knows what's going to happen next. next. Um, so any talk about Machu Picchu really needs to start with the question of, of discovery and, and the very meaning of these words. And of course, you know, this, this exploration of the word discovery um, presents an opportunity to talk, to discuss, at least briefly, about the very recent celebration, quote unquote, on celebration of Columbus Day. And what many of you, I'm sure, are seeing as uh, ongoing protests against colonial and other at least problematic statues worldwide. Uh, what do we celebrate uh, when we are celebrating Columbus Day? Uh, why this emphasis on discovery? and uh, what's in a name. Um, so uh, the first thing I would like to say about this is that most tours that you take in Cusco, that you take in Machu Picchu, most of the guidebooks you, uh, you buy um, before you visit Peru um, uh, and, and, and other places throughout the post-colonial world, insist and promote this narrative of discovery. Um, that, that these places were once upon a time discovered. Um, and that narrative on discovery basically presents this embedded message that these places, Machu Picchu, Peru, the post-colonial world, only matter insofar as they are unveiled by the global north, by, uh, as they are discovered by the developed world as they are uplifted by the West. And uh, even more importantly than that, they only matter once and deal, uh, once or if they become consumable in multiple forms, ways, and shapes. Whether it's by visiting these places, by consuming documentaries on these uh, countries, by you know, ultimately buying a souvenir, a, a, a piece of, of these uh, places and peoples discovered by, by, um, by the global north. And Machu Picchu is not the exception to this narrative. Um, Machu Picchu is presented as a place that was once discovered. So the conventional narrative of discovery of Machu Picchu goes as follows. There was a Gale history professor uh, who directed an expedition in search for the alleged uh, lost city of Vilcabamba. The professor's name was Hiram Bingen. Um, he was seeking for this source of fascination really since colonial times. Um, as early as the 16th century, 
expeditions have been looking for the ultimate lost city of this grandiose empire. Uh, so once in Peru in 1911, um, local authorities uh, directed um, Haram Bingham towards the Urubamba Valley. Uh, this is the preceding valley. Um, it's actually the valley that you go through uh, by train uh, on your way to Machu Picchu. And uh, in July 24, uh, led by a local Quechua speaking campesino named Melchor Artiaga, Bingham finds Machu Picchu, uh, quote unquote, the, the finding, or you know, finding really more than discovering. Um, upon finding Machu Picchu, he returns to the United States and then he organizes two more expeditions with the purpose of excavating uh, the site. Uh, the first expedition in 1912, the, the following year, and the last third expedition in 1915. In all these expeditions and excavations, he extracted a number of artifacts that were later brought to the United States. And all these expeditions and all these excavations had actually initially been supported by Peruvian authorities but later on were resisted by local populations. Once local populations found out what was happening exactly and where these artifacts were being transported to, that they were being extracted from, this, from, from the country, um, uh, a number of local populations actually opposed the continuation of these excavations. Um, needless to say, needless to say, the world celebrates Bingham's courage and endurance. Um, in many ways, he embodied a sort of modern conquistador, a predecessor of Indiana Jones. What would make the case that Indiana Jones could be based largely on the figure of uh, Hiram Bingham. Um, and until recently, very few people focus, say, on the role of Melchor Artiaga, uh, the local guide who um, led uh, Bingham to finding Machu Picchu. And more importantly than Melchor Artiaga, what Melchor Artiaga represents. Local populations knew very well the location of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. Communities lived and continue to live in its surrounding areas. Um, local labor became crucial for finding Machu Picchu and excavating and researching Machu Picchu. Nothing that is related to this global unveiling of the site and its subsequent scientific research could have been done with the participation of local populations. Yet the global narrative continues to center its celebration around the triumph of a white college professor over uncharted territories. I think even more problematic than Bingham himself is the role of institutions that sponsor his expedition. And that includes um, a neighboring institution, Yale University, of course. Uh, it includes the, the National Geographic, uh, and a number of other institutions that um, incarnated uh, in many ways, a new phase of 20th century, seemingly soft imperialism, you would call it, right? And what do I mean by imperialism? Why would I use the word imperialism? Well, I, I think 20th century imperialism, uh, at least the way I understand it, and you know, this, this relies on, on, on a great deal of scholarship that has explored the meaning of this, of this particular word, in the 20th century in the Americas, it's no longer a quest for territories. It's no longer the quest for the appropriation of territories. It's certainly no longer a quest of, uh, for the enslavement of peoples, though when the opportunity presented, they continue to do that, as it was the case with the rubber boom in the uh, uh, Amazon basin. Uh, this soft imperialism that I'm referring to here, it was a quest for the capture and extraction of knowledge in multiple forms. Uh, and for transforming global epicenters of knowledge into archives of, of artifacts of, um, uh, of the past, of, of ruins, and the building of museums and documental collections, some of them hosted in colleges, that um, you know, we observe and appreciate with fascination, but they also tell a story of ransacking of illegal extractions of, of robbery and um, the illegal making of, in this case, the United States, Yale University and the National Geographic of this, you know, super 
philanthropic, seemingly philanthropic institutions that really built its legacy based on illegal maneuvering. But what happened with Machu Picchu before, before Bingham? There was a history of Machu Picchu before Bingham. And um, we know aspects of this history and uh, there, there are aspects of this history that also remain hidden. Um, this ruins that we currently know as Machu Picchu um, are allegedly or were allegedly built between 1450 and 1460 by one of the first historically documented Inca rulers named Pachacutec. It was a royal estate for his panaca, his royal family. Um, and um, let me put it this way. When you first hear about the Incas, you hear about the Inca empire. You, you, you hear about the imperial Inca. Were they really an empire? Um, well, that's still a matter of debate. Um, some people argue they were, some people argue they weren't. Um, my personal peculiar view is that the expansion of, of the Incas, it's really a, a, a very interesting evidence of the, of the social, cultural power of kinship. And it's enormous extent, but at the same time, it's evident fragility was, you know, both the blessing and the course of the power of kinship. Uh, that's how they built this, this um, fantastic um, territorial extension. Um, and it's through the mobilization of labor that they could build some of the ruins that we identify with this imperial legacy. Well, within that view, Machu Picchu is probably one of the best symbols that incarnate the imperial aspect of the Incas. Um, it, it, it was built in the midst of the greatest moment of territorial expansion of, uh, uh, of, of the Incas. Uh, during the Spanish colonialism, between 1532 and 1821, and, and the first 50 years of the Republic, Machu Picchu remains hidden. And, and, and pay, please pay attention to that word. It remains hidden, but not lost. It remains veiled, covered, uh, but not entirely lost. There, there are reports, there are narratives about the existence of this site. The reason why it remains hidden though tells you something about the powers that rule Peru during colonial times and at least in the first 50 years of Republican life. And that something is that this site and this particular region where Machu Picchu is located held nothing of interest for both forms of the state power, held nothing of interest for the colonial state and the early Republican state. During colonial times, the vice regal state only cared about silver and tribute. During early Republican times, this feeble emerging Peruvian state continued caring about extractable resources and taxes. Hence, the site remained neglected because it held nothing that was of interest for those extractions. It presented nothing that was extractable. Now, this question, this point on extractability on, on the capacity of extracting or presenting something that can be extractable lead us to talk once again about the excavation of Machu Picchu and its meaning. I want to really turn this upside down. More than a cultural endeavor, more, much more than a cultural endeavor, the excavation of Machu Picchu inaugurates, at least in the Andes, though with some global repercussions, because remember, the excavation of Machu Picchu is happening, is happening uh, once, for instance, uh, excavations in Egypt have considered the Valley of the Kings exhausted. And a decade before Howard Carter entered King's to, King Tut's tomb, it precedes some of these great archaeological discoveries in the early 20th century. Um, it inaugurates this, this new form of approaching to a site and transforming it into something that can be extracted. 
And it presents this moment in which archaeology as a discipline emerges for imperial or at least neo-imperial purposes. What does archaeology do? Well, yes, it does a, it does a great job preserving, uh, rescuing, showcasing, and creating the, the narrative that allow us to um, uh, know about a, a, a very distant past. But, but also, especially in this time of history, the early 20th century, archaeology transforms sites like Machu Picchu or the Valley of the Kings in Egypt or uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, transform all these sites into the mains of intellectual, academic, and philanthropic institutions whose ultimate purpose is converting former and current imperial powers, primarily France, Great Britain, and the United States, into archives of artifacts ransacked globally. And if you don't believe me, just go to the three main museums of each of these countries, the Louvre, the Met, and the British Museum, and see the legacy of a, a global campaign of ransacking, to which archaeology was absolutely essential. That is what I believe Machu Picchu inaugurates in the Andes with some global repercussions. Machu Picchu also these days incarnates the, uh, what, what my colleague actually, uh, Mark Rice published um, just a couple of years ago, this fascinating book that I would like to showcase here. And I encourage you all to buy it, by the way, it's a great narrative of, on, on, on the transformation of Machu Picchu into a symbol of Peruvianness, of Peruvian identity. And uh, in, on, on this book, my colleague Mark Rice quotes uh, President Alan Garcia uh, when he once said uh, that, that Machu Picchu was the synthesis of, of all things Peruvian. And it's an unquestionable symbol of Peruanidad. It's an unquestionable symbol of Peruanidad. In 1981, it was declared domestic patrimony of the nation. Um, perhaps Machu Picchu is the only icon that surpasses food as a cohesive element for Peruvians. Uh, globally, Machu Picchu has been incorporated into the pantheon of heritage sites, first in 1983 by UNESCO, and later in 2007 as one of the new seven wonders of the world. And all of those transformations of Machu Picchu into patrimony is a quest for protection. Of course, it is a quest for protection, but it's also a source of endangerment because it has granted Machu Picchu visibility that it didn't have before. As I was telling you at the beginning of my lecture, I have visited Machu Picchu way before it was cool to go to Machu Picchu. And I have witnessed over the course of my life how Machu Picchu has become this source of global fascination and the number of uh, uh, tourists, visitors, and all the industry that surrounds this, this global, uh, this arrival of, of, of global populations into this small site has endangered the site. Um, Machu Picchu is also a stage for, for cultural representations. Um, it hosted Charlton Heston and uh, Peruvian opera singer Ima Sumac uh, in this 1954-1955 movie, The Secret of the Incas. Bollywood has filmed there. And it held the inauguration of a Peruvian president, Alejandro Toledo, in 2001, who claimed to be a new Pachacuti, who claimed to be the sort of restorer of the uh, Inca uh, grandiosity. Um, it is a stage for cultural and political purposes because I think Machu Picchu seems to represent that classical past that it's equivalent to ancient Rome or Greece, and not just for Peruvians. Uh, for all their Andean nations and arguably for all Latin Americans. However, at the same time, it also happens while at least Peru denies the importance of policies and politics for contemporary indigenous peoples, some of which live very close to the site. Machu Picchu holds both this great source of income for the Peruvian states and some of the poorest indigenous and campesino populations very nearby the site. So yes, it is the synthesis of all things Peruvians because it embodies the contradictions of a state that celebrates its Inca past while it continues to massacre its contemporary indigenous populations. And it celebrates a world that protects heritage before protecting peoples.
And just to finish, the, the I don't want to make this very long so we can have room for Q&A, but um, there seems some, some question on, on sustainability for the future of Machu Picchu. It, it, it seems the future fairly unsustainable. Um, one of these first sources of un, um, unsustainability it ha was the Yale University Peru dispute. Basically through 2001 to 2006, uh, when Alejandro Toledo was in power, his wife, um, a uh, Stanford educated uh, uh, Belgian anthropologist named Eliane Karp, uh, uh, initiated a claim against Yale University for approximately 200 artifacts that Harem Binkham had brought to the United States and particularly to the Peabody Museum. Um, this dispute between Yale and the Peruvian state led to two uh, major agreements and finally to the return of all these artifacts to Peru in three batches in 2006, in 2010, and in 2012. Um, and all these artifacts, by the way, are currently exhibited in the Museo Casa Concha in Cusco City. Um, tourism is also a form of capitalism, and it has built a much needed predatory infrastructure for the sustenance of this capitalist aspect of its activity starting with the building of uh, a problematic hotel that exists next to the ruins and ending with the projected construction of the Chinchero airport, perhaps to be finished in 2022, that endangers the environments and the livelihoods of people in the Chinchero Plateau, all for the sake of tourism. And of course, ultimately the travel agency model, which Peru for Less doesn't represent because we do a great job uh, caring for the sustainability of the site, hence these lectures. Uh, but uh, many of the policies recommended by UNESCO are completely overlooked by most travel agencies. One of them limiting the capacity of the site to I think 500 visitors per day that travel agencies just ignore for the sake of income. Um, and this continue to depredate the site and to make the existence of these ruins ultimately unsustainable. So once again, to return to the question that I started with uh, this lecture, will these ruins be forever? Uh, I, I don't think the answer is a certain yes. I'll finish here so we can have some room for Q&A. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks so much, Javier. That was excellent. It was truly fascinating to learn about Machu Picchu's legacy and its complicated past, present, and future. Um, we have received a few questions from the audience. And I do want to remind you that if you have questions, it's not too late to submit any. Please feel free to leave a question in the comment section on Facebook or use the Q&A section here at the bottom of the Zoom browser. The first question we have is from Hal Stratton, who says, I hope Machu Picchu will still be there. The crowds that visit now remind me of Disneyland. How would you, uh, he would like to know, what is the solution to balancing overuse with the public's right to visit? Well, thank you so much for the question. And in, in brief, the answer is, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a college professor, not a, not a, not a policy maker, but um, I think one of the, 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 ch the changes that we need to, um, we need to do, um, we need to conduct has less to do with policy and more to do with a cultural change um, and, and you know, our own responsibility as travelers. And in many ways, I think the Corona crisis, the, the sanitary crisis that we're going through has sort of highlighted that. Uh, I was among those who went to places just because we could afford to, because why not? Right, and I was telling you at the beginning. I went twelve times to Machu Picchu. Did I go to? Did I need to go twelve times? Of course not. Absolutely not. I have contributed to the unsustainability of visiting Machu Picchu. Right. Um, just a few minutes ago, before we started the lecture, the uh, Minister of Tourism has announced that Machu Picchu will be the first site to be carbon neutral, um, the first um, archaeological site in Peru, and probably I think in the Americas to be carbon neutral. Well, what does that mean? It means very little. If everything that revolves around Machu Picchu doesn't enforce also some policies that go along with that carbon neutrality that they're trying to promote on the site. Um, there is this interesting complex between Machu Picchu and Cusco City. And in Cusco City, people continue to be building hotels in the midst of the historical downturn. Um, 
uh, there is this um, a few hundreds acres of land that, that are the, the biggest basurero, the biggest garbage disposal land uh, in Peru within miles from Cusco City, which is the, the heart of tourism related fiscal income. Now, while that doesn't change, we cannot talk about any efficient change in the site itself. But, but then again, I, I think it relates more, more to our, our practices as travelers. And, uh, and I think in many ways, uh, the, 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 the sanitary crisis is, is, is putting that into question already. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yes, of course. I mean, that is a bit of a contradiction with, with what's happening <laughs> with Cusco and, and um, the hope for Machu Picchu's sustainable future. Um, and hopefully in both aspects will come together, both um, improving you know, sustainability around, um, around Cusco and everything that goes along with making Machu Picchu carbon neutral and also encouraging travelers to be more responsible. We have another question um, from Michael. He would like to know, why has the world been so fascinated with Machu Picchu? What is its unique charm? Um, I think it's a combination of two things, um, at least. Uh, one of them is um, accessibility. Uh, Machu Picchu, as uh, entrenched as it seems to be, because you have to travel to Peru, and, and let's be honest, you know, m most people before knowing about Machu Picchu don't even know where Peru is, right? You, you learn about Peru because you're going to Machu Picchu and, and then you know where, where Peru is ultimately located. And in Peru, it's really difficult to get Machu Picchu. Even for Peruvians, it's difficult to get to Machu Picchu. Um, uh, and so in spite of that entrenchment, it, it's fairly accessible. Right? It's much more accessible than going to seemingly similar sites like ancient Egypt, I mean, ancient Mesopotamia is not really an option anymore due to the conflict that has been uh, ravaging um, that region for the last two decades at least. But um, um, it, it's accessibility, but also this imbuing narrative of fascination about its, its lost, its, its, its lostness, that it was, it was the last city of the Incas, it was this lost bastion of, of, of Incas resisting the Spanish domination and all the uncertainties that surround that, um, that moment, those, all those years in which it remained unveiled. Uh, the speculations about mysticism. Uh, of course, I, I don't have to tell you how many times I have been confronted with the question about whether this was built by aliens or not. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A and I'm so happy that no one is asking that yet. Um, but uh, there, is, there, there, there are a number of fascinations that really merge together, but primarily it's accessibility and this, um, um, this uncertain past that is still surrounds the real meaning of Machu Picchu. I completely agree. I think the fact that, you know, the Spanish never found this place of the Incas really adds to its like charm and like, oh, it must be this really incredible special place, you know, that's untouched by the Spaniards when everything else in the region was, you know, largely destroyed um, during the conquest in, in a lot of archaeological sites were. Um, another question that we have from Tom Sheeran is he would like to know how the Chinchero Airport might impact the region. Well, that, that's a very good question. I mean, all questions are very good. That's a very good question. Um, the answer is negatively, uh, no matter how you look at it. Um, the Chinchero Airport is being built on a very environmentally fragile uh, Andean plateau. And it's being built there, of course, for logistical reasons, because as those of you who may have gone to Cusco know, the Velasco Astete Airport lies in the midst of a very, very tiny valley is one of the most difficult airports to hold landings. Uh, you have to be a very seasoned pilot to, to, to be allowed to fly to Cusco, and it only allows a limited number of flights that are expected or have been expected at least before coronavirus to increase uh, exponentially within the years. And so the Chinchero Airport seems to resolve that problem. But in building, in creating just the available land for building this airport, 
uh, the Peruvian state has already unleashed a process of population displacement, uh, enagination of lands, um, um, lack of consideration for the um, livelihoods that have for centuries inhabited this, this plateau and for the domestic, the small local economies that depend on these livelihoods, particularly I'm referring to shepherds and the textile economy of the Chinchero Plateau, all of which will be completely wiped out for the sake of building this airport. Let alone, let alone, just to finish with this question, let alone the narrative of corruption that surrounds the building of this airport. airport. As many of the state officials that have been in charge with commissioning this, this airport, including the current president, uh, might have been involved in corruption schemes uh, while discussing, while approving the project for, for the construction of the Chinchero Airport. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on that. That was a great question um, by Tom. Our next question will be from Joseph Bayes. He would like to know, uh, he says that other ruins such as Tikal in Guatemala have deteriorated rapidly, rapidly once unearthed. Is this an issue for Machu Picchu too? In, in brief, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, that's why UNESCO, um, more so than local authorities in Peru, have tried to impose this limit of visitors per day. Uh, but domestically, UNESCO's policies and recommendations, they are not echoed, not even echoed. Um, and, and that deterioration happens and will continue to happen insofar as these policies remain neglected. Uh, so, so yes, it, it, is a, it, is, it is not even a future danger. It is a, it is a present process, it is happening. Uh, as we speak, or it was happening right before the pandemic. It's not happening as we speak because there are almost no visitors. The, uh, Machu Picchu just had its first visitor, um, um, I think, yesterday. Yes, it did. It's very exciting. <laughs> they had its first visitor. Um, well, thank you so much, Javier. We still have time for a few more questions, so I'm just going to keep asking them um, to try to get in as many as we can. Um, another uh, another question we have is from Jeff uh, Lelick. Uh, he would like, he says, we have some friends who visited Machu Picchu and then hiked a few days to see another site, which they said was nearly equal to Machu Picchu. Do you know how many sites um, there are that are similar to Machu Picchu that might be alternatives to visit? Are they as impressive and are they accessible with a bit of work? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, Choquequirao, uh, which was discovered, quote unquote, uh, much more recently. Uh, was, I think, maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, recast as the new Machu Picchu. And uh, that sort of archaeological fascination about finding the new lost site continues to our days. Um, this region remains fairly unexplored. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure as projects will resume in the next few months and years, there'll be new findings of, you know, this is small ruin here, this, this is small ruin there, sometimes not so small. Uh, that is that is just as incredible. It's just as fascinating, um, and I, I think you know to to sort of like go back also about the question of the fascination and whether Chukarikirao is a fascinating or or any other site is a fascinating. All the fascination of this construction in the Andes relate to one principle, and that is the triumph of human genius over what we consider to be a seemingly hostile environment, right? These places are built in, in terrains in which we can barely walk because how, how, how thin the air is, how, how little oxygen is available for even walking there. Um, and you know, that is one of the greatest achievements, not just of the Incas. I mean, the Incas are sort of like latecomers in the development of Andean civilization. Uh, but every single civilization that developed in the Andes in pre-Columbian times had to deal with altitude as and seemingly unsurmountable, but ultimately tameable aspect of their livelihoods. Uh, and, and so just to answer your question more directly, yes, there are other sites. Yes, they're fascinating. All of them are fascinating for the same reason. And yes, they are accessible if, if you're ready to walk, if you're ready to do a trek. And of course, Peru for Less can help you with that once the traveling resumes. 
uh, they, they are worth a visit. I have only visited besides Machu Picchu, Sugar Giral, and it's absolutely worth a visit. And that one I visited only once, not 12 times. That one's a little, it requires a little bit more walking to get to, so understandably you only went once. <laughs> well, our next question is from Steve. He would like to know, um, he says that having also visited Machu Picchu many times, he finds that in spite of imperialistic impacts, the magic and the people who created the site remain. Would you agree? And can you comment on the survivals within the site? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, so, so yes, I, I, I agree with what the question, the premise of the question is. Uh, and if I am understanding correctly, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll react to the question. Um, I think it's impressive in general, once you travel through the post-colonial world, and, and that's what the Andes are, uh, the heart of the Andes are the heart of a post-colonial world. It is surprising, it is breathtaking to see a culture, a people that continues to be alive not only in spite of colonialism, but also because they mastered colonialism. And the, you know, Machu Picchu is fascinating as it is, um, you know, all those stones, the architecture, the building of this place in this particular, in this particular region, in this particular site, it's also an element, a piece of a large, larger human canvas that is not dead. Is far from that. Is very well alive and, and and in many ways thriving, in spite of colonialism, in spite of imperialism, and in spite of a neglecting contemporary Peruvian state that cares very little about those populations. Uh, and nevertheless, you know, most most of tourism around Cusco concentrates in in June because it's one of the key months of the festivity calendar in the region. And that festivity is hosted by contemporary peoples that celebrate their survival and their, their multiple transformations within these really obliterating processes. So in as much as the ruins survive, people have also survived. And those two things together, ruins and people and, and a culture that is alive and thriving, it's, it's, it's definitely worth a visit and, and it's definitely worth, that is worth celebrating. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, I have, we have time for just a few more, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, Olga first would like to say wonderful talk and that she had the visit of vis uh, the privilege of visiting in 1995 with her children. Um, and then she also went again three years ago uh, and was shocked to see how much Aguas Calientes had grown in that site. She understands that the site is a main source um, of tourist income from Peru, but um, this is kind of a theme in the questions today, but how do we sustain and keep the site from being damaged beyond repair? Imposing limits is one of them. And, and I think all parties involved need to accept that um, um, they have to limit the, the income that they make. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is the prevalence of uh, uh, an informal sector in Peruvian economy, including in the tourist economy. So while state policies, which, which do not exist, and if they exist, they are not enforced, but let's say they were to exist and they were to be enforced, uh, they can regulate the formal sector. The informal sector does whatever they want to do, right? And many of the formal sector actually builds upon that informal economy for its success. Um, so that is really difficult to manage. Imposing limits, uh, accepting that we cannot depredate this site because it has to last forever. And that was the premise of the talk. Like, will these ruins be there forever? We, we tend to assume they, they will be because they have been, but that's not necessarily the case, not particularly in these times. Um, I mean, tourist destinations can be one of those places that can, could have been really benefited from the sanitary crisis because it has put things on hold for a while to recover, to replenish, to, to, to reduce the, the burden and the load uh, of, 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 of people that, that go there. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a big question that, that includes the formalization of, of some of, of providers, regulations, 
but it really it really all starts with a question on on on, on the consuming side on 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 us as travelers and, and our traveling culture right and and what i what i responded to a similar question at the beginning we have to stop going to places just because we can afford it um uh, if that doesn't change then it's not just machu picchu in danger it's it's many sites like Machu Picchu. Someone was mentioning Tikal in Guatemala, Teotihuacan in Mexico. All, all these sites are in danger insofar as this global attitude of just you know, consuming places in the broadest and deepest meaning of the sense consuming continued the same after the pandemic. Thank you so much, Javier. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank you all for submitting some great questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to get to all of them this time. Um, we will be having more lectures in the future. Uh, but first of all, I just want to thank Javier. Thank you so much for joining us again and for answering some of the questions. It was wonderful to hear you speak about Peru uh, again and share your knowledge with us. Um, so thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the team and, and thank you to the audience and the wonderful questions. I would also like to thank Prue for Less and Inca Expert Travel for hosting this great event. A big thank you as well to everyone who's able to join us tonight on Facebook Live and on Zoom. We hope you enjoyed learning about Machu Picchu's legacy with Dr. Puente in our Passport to Peru lecture series. Be sure to sign up for the next one this Saturday about the land of the Incas with Kim Aquari at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.